时长河。十二 ，Human history like a river will keep moving forward with moments of both calm waters and huge waves. We have before us the opportunity to forge a new world order. The problem with mo、uh, modern days unipolarity is precisely that the West is leading. Ukraine down the Primrose Path. We don't have enough tanks. We don't have enough vessels. We don't have enough planes to bring chip productions here to the U.S. I'm Andrew Collingwood. I write for Pornbrook Magazine and other online outlets on geostrategy, economics, and British politics. Hi, my name is Philip Pilkington. I'm a macroeconomist who spent nearly a decade working in investment management. Both of us believe that the world is undergoing a once-a-century geopolitical and macroeconomic shift. After decades of American leadership, the unipolar world is finally ending. Since World War II, America has set the terms of global trade, and it's backed these up. With its control over international institutions and its enormous military power, but things are changing. China is still rising. Russia has reawakened. Europe, America's longtime partner, is in long-term decline. Each week, we'll be dissecting three stories that illustrate the shift from how semiconductor shortages in Taiwan influence Japanese military spending to how a new scramble for rare earth metals is remaking U.S. foreign policy. We'll be talking about economics and geopolitics, but most importantly, we'll be talking about how they influence each other, how resource competition drives the great game of empires and alliances, and how that story is the great emerging tale of the 21st century. This is multipolarity. Charting the rise of the new multipolar world order. Stephen Walt is one of America's leading thinkers and theorists on international relations. He is the Rene Belfer Professor of International Relations at the Harvard Kennedy School at Harvard University, and he has made a series of important contributions to international relations academia. Most prominently, his balance of threat theory. Stephen Walt has co-authored or authored. Books including *The Origins of Alliances*, *The Israel Lobby and U.S. Foreign Policy*, *Taming American Power*, and *The Hell of Good Intentions: America's Foreign Policy Elite and the Decline of U.S. Primacy*. Professor Walt is also a regular contributor to *Foreign Policy* magazine, and as a long-standing opponent of U.S. military entanglement in the Middle East and the broader Washington consensus on foreign policy. Here at Multipolarity, we see him as somebody whose intellectual framework best explains the world today. Professor Walt, welcome to Multipolarity. It's a pleasure being with you today. So, Professor Walt,、um, I thought we might start with quite a general question. If we look back 30 years ago, the Cold War has just ended. The United States is effectively the unchallenged military, economic, and diplomatic power in the world. And at the time, I think many thought that 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 would last almost forever. There was a lot of talk about the end of history and so on. Today, things look very different. The U.S. is clearly challenged militarily, maybe not fully. It still has the most powerful military in the world, but there are challenges there.、Um, its economy is either uh, um, uh, slightly bigger than China or measured on a purchasing power parity basis, slightly smaller than China. And、um, especially in the wake of the Ukraine war, its diplomatic power seems to have waned. Substantially, I suppose the question is, where did it all go wrong, and and why? That is a big question. So I think you sort of trace two things. One is that the condition the United States found itself in at the end of the Cold War was an unnatural one. Its principal rival, the Soviet Union, having disappeared not entirely without warning, but、uh, very suddenly, very quickly, and fortunately, mostly peacefully. So the United States finds itself, as I think the elder George Bush said in a memoir,、uh, you know, at the pinnacle of power with the rarest ability. To shape the world, and that unnatural condition was not going to last. Other states were going to recover in various ways. Some of those states were going to coordinate their actions in a variety of ways to try and constrain what the United States could do, and that would include, by the way, some of America's closer allies who were uncomfortable even in the 1990s with the degree of latitude and impunity that、uh, Washington had. So this situation was not going to last forever, even though I think many Americans and、uh, many pundits thought it would, as as you said in your opening. 
So that's one aspect of the problem. The second aspect of the problem is the United States did some things that turned out to be counterproductive and hastened the decline of this unusual position of primacy. I mean, the most obvious one, of course, was the Iraq war. You could add the, the long war in Afghanistan, two wars that together, you know, cost the United States perhaps some $6 trillion, money that could have been spent uh, elsewhere. While that was happening, of course, China was rising very rapidly, aided in part by some American policies as well. So this position that the United States found itself in, in the early 1990s, was probably over, uh, you know, by the time the Obama administration came to an end. The United States is still very powerful, uh, by far the most powerful country in the world, but not in quite the position of unchecked primacy it had enjoyed 20 or 30 years earlier. And with all of the consequences that we've seen both for domestic politics, but also for our relations with others around the world. Just following up on that, do, do you view it then more so as a natural or inevitable outcome, or or do you think that that this was more so driven by some of the mistakes that that you highlighted? Uh, I I wouldn't try to put a percentage on it. I do think that the conduct of American foreign policy in this period was quite counterproductive, and the position of primacy we had been in could have lasted much longer had we conducted ourselves a little bit differently. Uh, the other thing I should mention, of course, is that the missteps of the last 25 years or so, not only did it undermine America's prestige in the world, the sense that the United States you know, stood for a particular set of values, understood how the world worked and knew how to manage it pretty effectively, uh, and also a, a degree of public support for these policies. All of these were undermined by the actions of the last uh, 25 years or so. The American uh, invasion of Iraq showed that we were not as committed to a rules-based order as we claim. We like those rules when they suit us, and we ignore them when they don't suit us. Some of the things the United States has done in waging the war on terror, including uh, the use of drone warfare, the use of torture against al-Qaeda members. This tarnished the American image quite dramatically uh, in various parts of the world as well. The financial crisis of 2008 was, I think, critical in this as well. Prior to that point, many people thought, you know, the Americans were kind of masters of the universe. They understood how economies work. You had to imitate their views on how to run an economy. And suddenly in 2008, that was exposed as hollow. And the U.S. financial system seemed as shaky or at least as corruptible as some others around the world. All of these things, it seems to me, contributed to a diminution of this American or the American image around the world as both virtuous, but also highly competent. And you put all of those things together along with some of the other setbacks. It doesn't mean the United States is suddenly, you know, uh, a weak great power or suddenly vulnerable or anything like that. Uh, but it does mean that the position we'd enjoyed 20 years earlier was gone. And you say that you think this came to a head uh, really in the Obama administration. Is there a particular event maybe that symbolizes or, or is indicative of that that stands out to you? Yeah, I, I don't think it came to a head. I mean, the, the beginnings of it really begin way back in the Clinton administration, some of the things that, uh, that Clinton did. But you see these things starting to come home to roost in a variety of different ways. The war on terror itself, a response to September 11th, but what people often forget is that September 11th was, in many ways, a response to American foreign policy. It wasn't a legitimate response, but al-Qaeda didn't just get up one day and decide it wanted to attack the United States. It had a set of grievances that were all based on the policies the United States had been following uh, in the Middle East. If you look you know, some years later, at 2014, uh, the Russian seizure of Crimea, uh, the crisis over the Maidan uprising in Ukraine, these are all in some respects a response to well-intentioned American efforts to cultivate Ukraine, to gradually uh, bring it into the West as well. And even though the United States may have had good intentions in trying to do this, was trying to fulfill a set of liberal values and maybe even help the Ukrainians achieve some of their national aspirations. What the Obama people forgot was that there was a major power sitting next door that was likely to object and that had options. 
right? So in, in a sense, you start to see this happening much earlier than the Obama administration. I think by the end of the Obama administration, it's now increasingly obvious that the American position in the world, again, it hasn't been totally reversed, but it had been significantly undermined. So I think let's just play devil's advocate with some of those good intentions. Let's look at this from the neoconservative or liberal interventionist point of view. They would argue that the the 20th century was a story of the defeat or perhaps even failure of totalitarian ideologies of fascism first and then communism. And the essential victory of liberal democracy, of international cooperation, and of trade. And they would perhaps argue that at the end of the uh, 20th century, the, during the 90s, the United States had a unique opportunity to remake the world for the better. Of course, it's better if everybody, if every individual in the world gets to live in a liberal democracy where their human rights are protected and they have a say in the way that they're governed and how they're governed. Of course, it's right that it would make for a better and more secure world if uh, liberal democracies reigned everywhere, because as the neoconservatives love to say, no two democracies ever went to war with each other, or no two countries with a McDonald's ever went to war with each other. And ultimately, we, we were living in an increasingly globalized world. We had this kind of the second great wave of globalization. The first one, of course, ended in 1914. And then we have the second great wave of globalization. So suddenly, things that happen in you know, Bosnia or the Sahel or in the Hindu Kush, they do start to affect us. So morally, uh, in terms of also the security of the world and in terms of our national security as well, it was important to go out and try to bring liberal and democratic values. That's exactly the, the mindset that I think drove a lot of this. And it's important, I think, to realize that it's not just neoconservatives, right? This was uh, the view of liberal internationalists in the Clinton administration as well. And you can understand why they felt this way, uh, given what had happened at the end of the Cold War, the breakup of the Soviet Union, the Velvet Revolutions in Eastern Europe. You know, Suddenly, democracy is spreading in lots of different places. The American economies are going like gangbusters in the 1990s. We appear to have the magic formula. Tom Friedman of the New York Times in his book, Lexus and the Olive Tree, basically says, look, if you want to survive in a globalized world, you have to become like the United States. You have to adopt more or less the American model of, of governance. And so there was this very powerful sense that the wind was at our back, that this was the natural trend of humanity, and that there might be a few little backwaters where these ideas wouldn't take root. Uh, but by and large, this was the only game in town. And what that meant was that trying to push the pace, right, accelerate this process, support the expansion of democratic rule and market economies, that was going to be relatively easy to do that it wasn't going to face a lot of resistance as well. So if you go again, go back to the Clinton administration, their national security strategy, the title of it was a strategy of engagement and enlargement. And by enlargement, they meant enlarging the sphere of democratic rule. Closely associated with that was the idea of hyper-globalization, that in addition to spreading democracy, we were going to spread markets, we were going to lower barriers to trade and investment, engage the entire world in a set of rules uh, that were largely written uh, in the United States. And so the United States takes the lead in forming the World Trade Organization. We're going to bring the whole world together in this uh, integrated, globalized economy. We're all going to get rich together. And that, of course, will reinforce the trend towards democracy. Eventually, countries like China are going to become democratic because they're going to get rich. They're going to get a middle class. That middle class will want political power. And then, as you said, democratic peace theory is going to kick in. The whole world will be mostly democratic, which means they'll all get along beautifully. And the United States, as a benevolent superpower, will manage the little adjustments that need to be made from time to time. You can see why this was an incredibly seductive picture. But there were at least two or three big problems. I mean, first of all, spreading democracy turns out to be very hard to do. What Americans had forgotten was that the process of democratization in the world had taken centuries, even in the democratic West. And that process was very contentious, often violent. In the United States, we fought a civil war 
over the definition of American democracy. This is especially true if you had to use military power to try and do it. So you could go into a country like Iraq and you could remove a dictator from power. But that didn't mean you knew how to create a successful democracy in its wake. And of course, most of the places where we tried to get rid of dictators in the hope of spreading democracy, we ended up with failed states. Instead, we ended up with Afghanistan. We ended up with Iraq. We ended up with Libya, etc. So this idea that it was going to be easy to spread democracy turned out not to be true. And in some of the places that democracy had started to take root, you began to see backlashes, including in parts of Eastern Europe as well. That's problem number one. Problem number two, of course, was that hyper-globalization, this idea that everything could be run by markets around the world, turned out to have a downside. Yes, it had lots of benefits, lifted millions of people out of poverty, helped India and China rise more rapidly, and probably made things good on balance or better on balance for a lot of American consumers who got cheaper goods and things like that. But what it failed to take into account was that this was also going to have really powerful effects on some industries in the United States and elsewhere, that even as the United States as a whole might benefit, some sectors of the economy were going to get wiped out. Um, And I think that plays a very critical role in the emergence of populism, whether in the form of Donald Trump or Brexit in the United Kingdom or elsewhere. So there was a growing backlash against the second part of American strategy as well. Um, And then, of course, finally, the fact that we had to rely so heavily on the military in some of these places not only warped our foreign policy in a variety of ways, but it also, I think, blew back in certain respects in American domestic politics and has contributed to the growing polarization in the United States as well. But that's a, that's a well, one of the interesting things you mentioned there is that it wasn't just the conservative end of the spectrum who pushed for this the international relations kind of intellectual framework. From a personal perspective, two of the key speeches that stand out were Madeleine Albright, who was, uh, of course, part of the Clinton administration. And her speech, I think it was 1997, but perhaps 1998 at the Naval Academy at Annapolis, where she was talking about how opening China up to trade was going to create a kind of a middle class, which would inevitably lead to the liberalization and democratization of Chinese society. The other great example that sticks in my mind, certainly as a Briton, was Blair's famous Chicago speech in 1999, I think in kind of April 1999, when he was trying to encourage the American political elite for support uh, to intervene in the former Yugoslavia and it, it it strikes me that you, you know you have these great liberals and, and Tony Blair was very much a liberal, as of course was uh, Bill Clinton. But now it, it seems that the very framework of international relations that they put in place has kind of sown the seeds of their downfall. Uh, I know domestic policy is perhaps not as much an area of expertise as as uh, international relations for you, but you see very much that the framework that they put in place has has created a backlash in the form of people like Donald Trump and indeed some of the popularist parties and individuals in Europe. And I wonder whether that, I wonder whether increasingly Western domestic policy policies because of that are becoming antithetical to some U S and Western foreign policy aims. For instance, I'm sure that, the U.S. at the moment would like to be economically engaging far more with Southeast Asia and in the Western Pacific. But is that at all domestically feasible? For instance, Donald Trump, one of the first things he did at office was withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And you know, Britain has just joined the successor version of that. But I imagine it would be extremely difficult for an American president to run on a campaign of joining such a, a free trade organization. And yet, I would also think that's exactly the sort of thing that a foreign policy thinker like yourself would suggest that America would have to do. Uh, That's exactly right. And it's a a really good point that one of the, uh, I think, most important sea changes in American foreign policy in the last decade has been the shift away from a broad general consensus view that the United States supports free trade, opening markets, things like that. Now, To be clear, at various points in our past, the United States has departed from that. Different presidents have, for different reasons, imposed a variety of protectionist measures on a small scale. 
But they, from 1945 onward, the United States has generally supported the idea of lowering tariffs, integrating economies in a variety of ways, with occasional concessions to domestic politics. Beginning with Donald Trump, that changed, right? He adopted very much a sort of zero-sum transactional protectionist attitude, sometimes overstated, right? The United States continued to trade and invest while Trump was president and at times, you know, negotiated new free trade agreements of various sorts. But his worldview was clearly much more wary about all of this. And you uh, you mentioned his decision to leave the Trans-Pacific Partnership. That's a perfect example. But notice, Hillary Clinton campaigned against the Trans-Pacific Partnership in 2016. She understood it was not politically popular. And the Obama administration, in which she had served, never submitted it for ratification in the U.S. Senate because they knew it, it wouldn't pass as well. Even more telling, the Biden administration has, if anything, doubled down on many of the approaches that Trump ha has made. They've imposed greater trade restrictions on China. They have acted unilaterally in passing the Inflation Reduction Act, which has all sorts of measures in it that are essentially violate World Trade Organization rules and have upset American allies, both in Asia and in Europe. And at a moment when they recognize that it's very important to compete with China and that China's most powerful weapon right now, most powerful tool of influence is economic, not military. The United States is, for I think largely domestic political reasons, unable to use access to the American economy as a negotiating tool, as a tool of influence. So just to take one final example, the Biden administration has laid out what they call the Indo-Pacific economic framework. And this is a pretty weak beer. Uh, it doesn't have any sort of access provisions to give countries in Asia greater access to the American economy, which is what they most want, precisely because the Biden people are worried about what the domestic political implications are. And that's a, a real change in how the United States has dealt with the rest of the world. Uh, and I think uh, a real crippling of what has been a, a very important tool of American influence over time. Since we're on the topic of domestic issues, which I think we'll move away from after this, but there is one trend that's really stood out, especially to me as a foreigner in recent years, is that, you know, thinking back to the Iraq war, which has loomed pretty large in our discussion so far, and I think in your thinking about the world too. The opposition to that obviously came from the liberal left primarily. Yet today, um, especially in the wake of the Ukraine war, you have a kind of political type in America that is very, very liberal on domestic issues, but is extremely hawkish in their foreign policy. Now, when Russia was the target of that, I think it was somewhat understandable. There was, there was lots of partisan issues about election interference and so on. Um, but it, what's been very striking, especially in the last few months, has been how easy that hawkishness seems to be transferring from Russia to China. I think both both Andrew and I have been very surprised by that. I, I'd wonder what you make of that development. Well, first of all, I might question the initial uh, claim. I mean, if you go back to the Iraq war, uh, there was very little opposition to it in the United States by the time the United States went to war. Remember that both uh, there are obviously Republicans under Bush, but most Democrats supported the war. Joe Biden voted for the war. Hillary Clinton voted for the war. Lots of liberal internationalists in the academic community uh, and the think tank world in Washington supported the war. It was actually not liberal lefties that uh, opposed it. It was sort of realists like me who understood this was a bad idea. Now, today, you're absolutely right that we have a very powerful consensus across most of the uh, political spectrum uh, supporting Ukraine for all sorts of, of understandable reasons. But many of the people who eventually became skeptical about American interventionism uh, have been uh, all in for Ukraine. Again, hardly anybody is supporting Putin and Russia actively, but the people who are skeptical of a sort of unconditional support for Ukraine come from mostly the parts of the Trumpian end of the Republican political spectrum and a handful of people that I would put on the far left. So it's the two ends of the political spectrum uh, that oppose it, or at least are skeptical. And almost everybody in the middle is both all in and very intolerant of anyone who questions both how we got into this uh, horrible tragedy in Ukraine, 
or the way in which the United States and others are dealing and, with it. And perhaps you could say something about the the China situation. So um, I, I don't know if it's as clear if if the liberal left is as animated, I suppose, by China. Obviously, Trump's uh, big part of his platform was a, was a kind of an anti-China thing. But d- do you agree with me that the feelings are being transferred over to China? If so, why? There's no question that one of the other sort of striking developments over the last eight to 10 years has been the emergence of quite a powerful bipartisan consensus that China is the challenge, China is the problem, and that this now uh, subsumes most of the economic interests in the country, certainly uh, most of the national security establishment in the country. It's maybe the one big issue where you can get most Republicans and most Democrats to agree and maybe even go so far as to try and compete with each other for who can be more hawkish uh, on China. So you have this uh, odd situation where the former Speaker of the House, Democrat Nancy Pelosi, of course, causes an international, I won't call it a crisis, but an international episode by going and visiting Taiwan, even though the Biden administration doesn't want her to do that, understands it's counterproductive. Uh, But she goes ahead and does it anyway. And of course, uh, after she leaves office, is replaced uh, by Speaker McCarthy, he then has a meeting in the United States with the president of Taiwan, sort of doing the same thing that she did, a slap in the face to the Chinese and a way of showing that he's tough on China as well. Lots of support for, you know, greater military spending focused on China, lots of support for the efforts to maintain American dominance in certain semiconductor chip and artificial intelligence domains, uh, etc. This is something that everyone, I think, pretty much agrees on. And there are a rather small set of voices saying, yes, China is a competitor. Yes, China's a, a rival. But we need to manage this competition intelligently so that we don't get into a situation where both countries end up being substantially worse off, partly because of the economic consequences of separating the two economies, but also because of the risk that there could be a, a military clash, maybe not immediately, but at some point down the road that would have you know, un- unpredictable, but almost certainly ominous consequences. On that matter, it, it seems fairly clear that the unipolar world order that we have uh, experienced since the uh, early 90s is now, I would probably argue, replaced by a multipolar world order with uh, the United States, China, uh, and the weaker of the three great powers, but still a great power, Russia, uh, as the three great powers within the system. I know that you're part of the broad church of realism in international relations. Now, some realists argue that a multipolar world order should, in theory, be more stable and less prone to the sort of uh, catastrophe that you said was possible between the United States and China in your previous answer. Because in a multipolar world order, different great powers are able to switch allegiances whenever they feel another great power is being overly aggressive or acting in a way that unbalances the system. And I suppose Europe from the uh, in the 18th and 19th and even the early 20th centuries was an example of that where you had shifting alliances to contain uh, the Habsburgs and and then the French and then the Russians and, and eventually the uh, Prussians and Germans. On the other hand, you get other realists who say, actually, a multipolar world is much less stable because in a bipolar world, for example, obviously in a unipolar world, there's, you know, the single great power is unchallenged. But even in a bipolar world, each of the powers can be uh, 100% certain that the other would oppose any major act of aggression or any major attempt to expand uh, power and influence. Uh, and therefore, they're much less likely to miscalculate than in a multipolar world where uh, different powers might not quite understand who would oppose what. I mean, a nice example of that would be the unification of Germany under uh, Otto von Bismarck, where uh, his efforts very much went under opposed, first against uh, Denmark, then Austria, then uh, France. He managed to isolate individual powers within the system, and that ultimately led to great disbalance within Europe as well. Where do you stand on that debate? And given your stance on that debate, what what do you see the risks 
being in the multipolar world that we're now entering? Or what do you think the kind of the positive prospects for such a multipolar world? You've summarized that debate very, very nicely. In that world, I come down on the sort of bipolarity is better than multipolarity, that a world of, of two clear, distinct great powers um, and then lots of, of weaker powers is ultimately more stable than a multipolar world of several great powers, precisely because it is more predictable. There's less danger that one revisionist power will decide it can do something before the others can get their act together to stop it. So it seizes an opportunity there. That doesn't exist in bipolarity. You know the other major power will oppose you from the get-go as well, and that it's going to be serious, right? You're going to be dealing with a a rival that has roughly equal capabilities. Therefore, it's going to be a costly, difficult, protracted struggle. So you might as well not do it. One big challenge, unfortunately, is that there's no consensus definition among international relations scholars on what is a great power, how you even define them. And for that matter, there's no really consensus definition on how to measure power. We use various indicators, GDP, GDP per capita, military spending, things like that. But we don't agree as scholars on, you know, do nuclear weapons fit in here? And to what extent do they enhance a country's power? We don't know how to take into account geography. Does America's favorable position in the Western Hemisphere with no enemies nearby, does that enhance our power? Does Russia's geographic expanse, the fact that it touches so many other countries, enhance its power, give it the ability to punch above its weight because it can intervene in various places as well? There's a big debate among scholars even today as to whether or not we're in the last waning years of unipolarity, an emerging bipolar world, some kind of lopsided multipolarity. I tend to think it's the latter, that it's the United States and China substantially stronger, but Russia cannot be counted out. Uh, You can't simply ignore what it might do, as uh, unfortunately, I think the United States did for, uh, for a long time. And there are a few other countries that might sort of rise up into the great power ranks, although they're going to be substantially weaker than, say, the United States or China. India, over time, uh, is going to be the most populous country, developing economically quite rapidly. Interesting geographic location as well. Japan is still the world's third largest economy and has announced major plans for military modernization. Japan could get nuclear weapons relatively quickly. So you can imagine a multipolar world. You can even imagine some slightly more cohesive European Union that begins to develop real strategic autonomy, as some Europeans have uh, long advocated, that it begins to form more of an independent pole, not immediately, but over the next decade or or so. Anyway, I think we're uh, heading into a lopsided multipolar world and therefore one that has a somewhat higher risk of uh, you know, great power confrontation than we had under bipolarity or even under unipolarity, uh, which is another question. I wonder itself. then if perhaps some of the risks involved in a multipolar world might come from, uh, I, I don't want this to sound anti-American any, in, in any way, but uh, you know, at the moment, almost everybody in the US State Department, I should imagine, has had almost their entire career within a unipolar moment and where the predominant ideology has been liberal interventionism or neoconservatism, which, you know, whether you're a registered Democrat or registered Republican, it depends on what what it's called, but it's essentially the same foreign policy framework. So entering a a kind of a multipolar world, as far as I understand, really once you're no longer the kind of the single great power in the system, then there are restrictions on the on the extent to which you can project power and the other smaller powers have a, kind of an option an alternative they don't have to go the american way they can go the chinese way if they want or maybe the russian way if they're in eastern europe or central asia so the primary question tends to be security rather than ideology in that sort of system and i wonder whether you know in a state department where you know it's very much wedded to this kind of liberal interventionism or neoconservatism and people have had their entire careers within that intellectual framework and they've never known anything but a unipolar system whether them trying to impose those kind of neoconservative or liberal ideas on the world might hold a very great risk in a in a multipolar world order 
Yeah, I think you've uh, you've expressed it really well. And viewing this in sort of generational and mindset terms is, I think, very useful. Uh, you're exactly right that everyone uh, handling American policy today, their formative experience is sort of post-1992. The Cold War is ancient history, uh, eras where we really had to worry seriously about other great powers uh, is in the, well in the rearview mirror. This period of unipolarity, I think, fostered within the American foreign policy establishment, a sort of take it or leave it approach to the rest of the world, where we knew what was right. And if they didn't do it, uh, we would start ratcheting up the pressure, you know, grab them by the arm, start twisting harder. Now, in the case of adversaries, that would mean some military threats, uh, imposing economic sanctions, doing everything we could to try and pressure them to do what we want. And without much interest in compromise, without saying, look, we want all of what we want. Uh, going to Iran, we want you to give up your entire nuclear enrichment capability, all of it, every bit, 100 percent. And anything less than that, we're not interested in talking about. Um, and if you don't do it every year, we're going to ratchet up the sanctions a little bit more until you say uncle. Right. Um, so we were unwilling in many of these cases to say, take 80% of what we wanted. Uh, that's a hell of a, a, a good deal. No, we had a take it or leave it approach. And as we move to a more uh, multipolar order, you have to indulge in more give and take. Uh, you have to be willing to take 80% or 75%. Uh, you have to be willing to give the other side some of what it wants or you're not going to get a deal. And the reason we're going to have to start doing more of that is precisely the one you identified, that other countries are going to start to have options. Uh, Joe Biden, when he was running for president, said he was going to make Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, a pariah for the actions that bin Salman uh, had authorized. Uh, and of course, once he becomes president, he has to deal with Saudi Arabia in a very different way. Why? Because he's worried about inflation and he wants Saudi Arabia to keep pumping oil to keep energy costs down. Meanwhile, what is Saudi Arabia doing? Saudi Arabia, of course, is inviting pre Chinese President Xi Jinping for a state visit to Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia is announcing that it's going to build some refineries in China as well. The Saudis understand that in a world where suddenly the United States has, has other peer competitors, that gives Saudi Arabia some options. They can play China and the United States off against each other. And oh, by the way, Saudi Arabia has also been tacitly collaborating with Russia, not actively collaborating, but uh, the Saudis have an interest in high energy prices, and so do the Russians at, at this point. So Saudi Arabia has not been helping the United States and its other partners vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, again, precisely because it's not in Saudi Arabia's interests, and they have some other options. Now, the Saudis may be an extreme case because of uh, their oil supplies. But this same logic is going to apply to other countries as well. In a multipolar world, they have some greater options than they would have otherwise. And I wonder how that is going to, how Europe is going to fit into this uh, multipolar world, because it's clearly been behind America when it comes to Europe's Eastern approaches and some of the things that have been happening there over the, the last 18 months or so. A lot of people are kind of talking at the moment that because of the sudden stop in European Russia trade relations um, and some of the much longer term demographic and economic issues that uh, Europe is essentially a continent or certainly Western Europe is a continent uh, on the wane. Yet at the same time, it would seem to me that, you know, for realists like yourself, and I suppose in media terms, most prominently Elbridge Colby, who was part of the Trump administration, currently runs the Marathon Institute in, in Washington. They really view Europe as a, as a crucial part of, uh, of US foreign policy from a, a realist perspective. And the idea is this, that Europe should be responsible for, uh, you know, holding down one flank of the US. So the US itself can concentrate on holding down the other, which is in the Western Pacific. And I wonder how you see Europe's position in the co in the coming multipolar world, and whether you think it's on the wane, whether it's become, going to become a, a you know essentially a, a sat trap of U.S. foreign policy needs because of that weakness, or because of U.S. needs, or or, or whether indeed you see it as having a greater deal of autonomy because of this, and a greater deal of 
a strategic maneuverability, perhaps? This is a huge question. And I, I have uh, my own thinking on this has sort of evolved over time. But let me say several things. I mean, first of all, I think for structural reasons, the rise of China in particular, the United States is going to focus more and more of its foreign policy and especially military attention on Asia. The war in Ukraine has delayed that shift uh, for a variety of uh, reasons, but ultimately it's not going to up it. Uh, and I'll say a little about that as well. Um, now, if you go uh, then and you ask, does Europe have any significant security role to play in Asia? The answer is basically no. The big question is whether Europe will be able to defend its own interests in Europe, not that Europe is going to be sending expeditionary forces or naval fleets or vast uh, air armadas out to help uh, with security problems in Asia. That's just not going to happen. Now, then the question is, well, will Europe line up with the United States in other ways vis-a-vis -vis China? Will they collaborate in imposing economic restrictions on digital technologies? Will they uh, decline to... Uh, trade in areas that might be sensitive from a national security point of view? Will they, well. uh, will they do things that uh, the United States might encourage them to do vis-a-vis uh, -vis China? And there's some evidence uh, that they will. Uh, the attitudes in Europe have, towards China have changed a lot in, in recent years. My position all along has been that Europe cannot have it both ways, that they can't continue to rely upon American protection having the United States basically as Europe's first responder and at the same time remain largely neutral vis-a-vis -vis, um, vis -vis China, uh, that that won't be acceptable to the United States. Uh, eventually, people will say, if the Europeans want to be that close to China, that's fine, but now, now they're on their own. And my view had that um, what we need is essentially negotiating a new division of labor on transatlantic security, where the United States goes from being Europe's first responder to being its ally of last resort, uh, where Europeans understand that the United States is not going to be there unless the situation is truly dire. Uh, and that most of the time, Europe will be expected to handle its own security problems. So if something like Ukraine happened 10 or 15 years from now, the Europeans would be capable of responding and the United States wouldn't have to be doing most of the work. Meanwhile, what the United States will do will focus most of its effort in Asia uh, to try and maintain a, a balance of power there. That's uh, in Europe's interest overall, I think, as well. And I'd like this new division of labor to be negotiated you know, cooperatively. Now, there's some indications that the Europeans are, trying, are getting serious uh, about defense again. Uh, you know, there have certainly been lots of rhetoric. Uh, some European countries have announced significant defense increases. Uh, the real question is whether or not those promises uh, will be fulfilled. Europe has a long record of over-promising and under-delivering. My suspicion is that that won't happen unless the United States may makes it crystal clear that once the Ukraine war is over, uh, we are not going to play the role of first responder in the future. And over time, the American commitment to Europe is not going to disappear, but it's going to decrease. By the way, I'll add one other point is that means the United States has to change its attitude uh, where we expect to lead the alliance in every particular and sort of run the show. We have to be willing for a Europe to have more independent capability. And we need to have uh, be willing to recognize that on some issues, Europe won't agree with us. And that's fine if on balance, they agree with us on the big strategic questions. Very quick follow up on that. You mentioned Europe being in a position in say 10 years where if anything happened on the Eastern approaches, it would be something that they would be able to deal with. Uh, let's imagine a scenario, for instance, where Europe over the coming years does take an increasing share of the military burden itself and over a period of time develops a kind of unified command and control and indeed military structure, a kind of a, a NATO, but within the European umbrella rather than NATO itself. 10, 15, 20 years time, how would the United States feel about a unified EU military and perhaps a far more integrated EU foreign policy? I mean, how would it feel about a Europe with four, five, six aircraft carriers controlling the Atlantic approaches to Europe and the English Channel and the Mediterranean and perhaps even the the Greenland-Iceland-UK gap? I mean, the, would a realist not see that as... Uh, 
rather a threat in some way? I mean, that would be a genuinely multipolar. Yeah, I, th- I think that's true. And it's probably it's one of the reasons why the United States has generally opposed serious European unity. Uh, the American view on European unity has, has always been sort of some of it is good because that keeps peace and stability, but too much of it creates a potential pole, like a potential rival. I would be absolutely astounded if 15 years from now, the Europeans had five aircraft carriers and could play a significant role in the GI-UK gap. I don't think they're going to in- increase. And furthermore, given what Europe's security issues really are, that's not where they ought to be investing their, their money uh, anyway. The good news is what we've learned in the past two years is that Russian military power is not what people thought it was. There had been lots of people talking about how military reforms in Russia had made it more capable. It was starting to pose a genuine uh, threat to the rest of Europe. I think uh, the tragedy of the war in Ukraine has shown that uh, Russia's military uh, prowess is actually uh, pretty limited. They may ultimately eke out sort of a Pyrrhic victory that leaves Ukraine in terrible shape. But the idea that the Russian army is going to start marching west, uh, you know, through Poland, through the Baltic states into Germany is, I think, completely fanciful now. And that means that Europe has the wherewithal to deal with the major security problem it might face, which is you know, some possibility of a revisionist Russia. Uh, Europe spends three to four times what Russia spends on defense every year. They just don't spend it very uh, well if they did a substantially better job of uh, producing forces and allocating them and training them. They'd be in fine shape without a lot of, uh, of American help. So we would worry a little bit about a more capable Europe, but that just highlights that in a multipolar world, diplomacy becomes very important. You have to take European interests seriously. You spend more time sending people to talk to the Europeans about their interests. And you recognize that we do have uh, a degree of shared values across the Atlantic. So if you imagine a multipolar world in which there's a United States, a more unified Europe, a Russia, a China, maybe one or two others. Uh, my guess is that Europe and the United States would still find it easier to collaborate with each other than with just about anybody else. So finally, uh, before we finish this very interesting episode, I'm sure listeners would like to read more about yourself, Professor Walt, and uh, your ideas and views and analysis on the world. Uh, where are they able to do that? Perhaps uh, in magazines or in books or in social media. Perhaps you've even got a TikTok account. I don't know. You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, it's at Stephen Walt. Uh, I'm still, I haven't abandoned Twitter yet, although many people uh, have. Um, I would recommend people read my most recent book, which is, uh, as you mentioned, The Hell of Good Intentions, which is uh, basically a critical analysis of American foreign policy since the end of the Cold War. And uh, I write a column on a regular basis, usually every week or two for Foreign Policy Magazine. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm getting started on a new book, but it's not available yet and probably won't be for at least a couple of years. Marvelous. Well, Professor Stephen Walt, thank you very much for joining us on Multipolarity. It was a pleasure talking with you. It is a perplexing world because we are fresh from a huge victory.